again. Uh, welcome again to the refuge. We are so glad that you are here. Um, and I know that this is not something that they are necessarily seeking. And so, and I, I, if I'm being honest with you, they probably don't like that I'm doing this. Um, but we are very, very blessed um, and very, very um, blessed is a great word. Um, our band puts in work in hours, even throughout the week, and even comes in early on Sunday morning to uh, lead us to the throne in worship like this and to, to allow us to do this. And so I just want to thank them publicly for what they do. They're all going back there to get a drink of water because they've been working hard up here. But thank you so much, guys, for what you do. Um, Sometimes we need encouragement, and it's, it's one of those things that they probably didn't like me saying that, and it's one of those things that they're like, oh, I don't really want that, but since you're doing it anyway, I guess I'll take it kind of things, and so um, thank you so much for what y'all do. Y'all are a blessing to us, and, and we, it does not go unnoticed what the, work, the hard work that you put in. Um, we are continuing in our series called Standing Firm today, and we are talking about this idea that we live in an up and down world, right? I mean, one moment we can be up here, and then the next moment we can be down here. And this world that we live in just kind of goes like this. And if we are not able to stand firm in that, then we're never going to make it. We're never going to be who God wants us to be. We're never going to be able to live the life that God wants us to live. And so we have got to be able to stand firm. God wants that for us, and we should want that for ourselves because God has offered us and is offering to us a life that is rich and satisfying. John 10.10 10 says that it is an abundant life life everlasting. And so we want to grab a hold of that. So how can we stand firm? We're going to be in Philippians again, uh, chapter four today. So if you want to turn in your Bibles, you're more than welcome to do that. Once we actually get there, it will be on the screen so that you can follow along if you don't have your Bible and that's totally fine. Um, but Paul is writing to the church. He's writing to the followers of Jesus and he's doing a couple of things. Number one, he's thanking them for a gift. Remember that he, they, he, they found out that he was in jail and he wasn't able to take care of himself. And so they like traveled 1500 miles to to give him this gift, this monetary gift, so that he can continue to do ministry where he was. So he's writing to say, thank you so much for that gift. That's very, very thoughtful, I and mean, that's so great. But he's also writing to encourage them, because he knows that they're going through tough times. He knows that, you know what, they need some encouragement right now. Moms, do you need some encouragement? All right, life is tough for you, right? A lot of times where you're playing taxi driver, you're playing doctor, you're playing peacemaker, which can be really, really hard. I have a five and a half year old and a three and a half year old. I know how that goes, all right? Um, they, you are playing chef, uh, you are playing every sort of role that you can think of, homemaker, and yet it just seems like it just keeps coming. Life just keeps coming. It doesn't slow down. So it's important for us to have encouragement. And Paul is trying to encourage the church. And he's trying to encourage us as we do this. For tough moments like this, we need encouragement. And the Philippians were going through tough times. Okay, Make no mistake about it. They were facing persecution. They were feeling overwhelmed. They were feeling that they weren't good enough. They were feeling like, I'm just never going to make it. They were feeling up against deadlines and up against certain uh, obstacles that they couldn't overcome. Has anybody else ever been there? Has, ever, has anybody else ever been in a situation where you just feel overwhelmed? Where you just feel like the moment is too big and we need something to get us through it? And this is what Paul is doing. Is he's encouraging the church and he's encouraging us to stand firm. Okay, so we're going to be looking at this today in Philippians chapter 4. We're going to look at a very, very famous verse that probably all of you, if, most of you, if not all of you know this, all right? But here it is, Philippians chapter 4, starting in verse 10. This is where we are. It says, I rejoiced greatly in the Lord that at last you renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. I am not saying this because I am in need, for I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned that the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want, I can do all this through him who gives me strength. There's a couple of principles that I think that we can take from this today. That when we are facing tough times, when we are on the roller coaster that is called life, that we can 
apply them to our lives, to help us move in a better direction, to help us be who God wants us to be, okay? So number one, if you're taking notes, here it is. This is the first thing that we can do this. We can be content in Jesus. We can be content in Jesus. Now, I know that the world is not telling us that this is true. The world tells us that we need this gadget or that new thing and that will make us complete. If we just get this one thing, it will be better. Our lives will be better. If we just get that house or if we just get that car or if we just get those group of friends, if we just get this or we just get that, things will be okay and we will be complete and we will be better for it. I mean, think about it for just a moment. I think they're coming out with the Apple, the, the iPhone 8. I think it's coming out in September is the, the idea. How many people are going to be standing in line? And if you're going to be one of those people, I'm not like knocking on you, okay? So please don't think, oh gosh, I'm a bad person for wanting the iPhone. No, no. But how many people are going to be standing in line overnight waiting for that? A lot of people are going to, because they think if I just get that one thing, it'll be just that much better. My life will be complete. It will be all that I need. And that's what the world is telling us, and that's just simply not true. In fact, it's the complete opposite. It is the complete opposite. And if we are going to live this life, or if we're going to make it in this world as followers of Jesus, we have to be content in Him, okay? It is in Jesus that we find our joy. Happiness comes and goes with circumstances. Joy is an overwhelming thing that lasts, and in Acts chapter 16, if you go through and read that passage, it talks, it talks about Paul and Silas being in jail. And they're in jail, and at midnight they start singing these hymns and songs, and it's this great, wonderful praise, wor- praise and worship party in jail. And God hears that and makes an earthquake happen, and it opens up the, the doors. The jailer wakes up, he freaks out, sees what's going on, he's like, I'm not going down like this. So he starts to take his sword, and he's going to end his life that way. Paul and Silas say, no, 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 hey, dude, we're cool. We're still here. Everybody's still here. The jailer is overwhelmed with gratitude and says, why don't you guys come to my house? Takes them there. Paul shares the gospel with them. The entire household gets saved. And in Acts chapter 16, verse 34, it says that the entire household was saved and they were filled with the joy of the Lord. God gives us joy. Jesus gives us joy. It is in him where we find our joy. It is in him where we find peace. We talked about it last week in Philippians chapter 4, verse 7 and 8. That God in tough circumstances, when we trust in him, will give us a peace that passes all understanding. It's a peace that does not make sense for what you are going through. Why are you not freaking out? Because we have the peace of God. It is in Jesus that we find peace. It is in Jesus that we find love. That's the one thing that every person in this world is looking for. Everybody wants to be loved. Even the Beatles wrote a song about it, all right? Everybody wants to be loved. You want to feel loved. You want to feel accepted. You want to feel like you belong. And you know what? The Bible says in 1 John chapter 4, God is love. Like he is the very definition of love. And it is in Jesus that we find love. It is in Jesus that we find our salvation. You and I are not going to make it on our own. We're not good enough to get to heaven. There's not no amount of good deeds that you or I can do to get there. And the Bible says in John chapter 14, verse 6, that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father but through him. It is in Jesus that we find our salvation. It is in Jesus that we need to be content. And Paul is encouraging the church and he's encouraging us to be content in Jesus. Look back at our passage in verses 10, 11, and 12. Look at what he says here. He says, I rejoiced greatly in the Lord that at last you renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned, but had no, no opportunity to show it. Paul's like, I knew you guys cared, but I didn't know, you, you know, you couldn't really do anything about it. But oh my gosh, you heard about my situation and, and you sent this monetary gift, which by the way, I'm not after your money, but thank you very much. Okay, it's one of those things that people think that God's after their money and that's not it. God's not even close to after that. One way that we can show that we trust God is through our tithes and offerings, but that's not it. God is after our hearts. God is after your heart 
and he wants your heart to be in communion with him. And this is what Paul's saying. I knew you guys cared, but I, you didn't have any way to show it. Look at verse 11. I am not saying this because I am in need, for I have learned to be content. Whatever the circumstances, no matter what is going on, Paul has the secret here. Verse 12, I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I've learned the secret of being content. There it is again. In any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. Paul has learned the secret, and the secret is to be content in Jesus. To draw your strength from Jesus. To be content with who he is, and no matter what the situation is, he promises to be there. One of the things that gets overlooked in the Great Commission, which is great. The Great Commission is great. That's a lot of greats. But the Great Commission is so wonderful, and it tells us to give us our mission to go and to make disciples of all nations, teaching them, baptizing them, to obey all that he has commanded. One of the things that gets overlooked in that is the very last sentence that Jesus says, and surely I will be with you always, even to the very end of the age. We can be content in Jesus. And if we are going to make it in this world, then we must be, we have to be content in Jesus. The world's going to tell you something different. Don't listen. Don't believe the lie that is out there. Be content in in Jesus. And if we are going to be content in Jesus, then number two, if you're taking notes, we need to rely on Jesus' strength. We need to rely on Jesus' strength. We cannot be all that God wants us to be on our own. I mean, I don't have to tell you this. I, I know me, I don't have to tell me this, but we can't make it on our own. We mess up. We fail. And you know what? It's okay to admit that, all right? Nobody in here is perfect, myself included. We mess up. We can't make it on our own. We have to rely on Jesus' strength. And if we're going to get by, if we're going to thrive in a world that is telling us, that is constantly telling us that we need more, we have to have this in order to be complete, but we know what the truth says then we have got to rely on Jesus' strength. And this is what Paul's telling the church here. This is what he's saying in, in this verse. He says, I know that you're persecuted. I know that you're going through all sorts of things. I know that you feel overwhelmed. I know that you're facing tough times. I know that your lives are harder than you want them to be. I know that things aren't going the way that you want them to or thought that they should or would. But Paul's saying, you can draw your strength from Jesus. Look at verse, the, the very famous verse we talked about, Philippians chapter 4, verse 13. He says, I can do all this through him who gives me strength. Now, a lot of us probably grew up on a different translation. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And, and it's unfortunate that this verse has been kind of misconstrued that way in, in everything. Um, and, and I'm about to, to share some stuff with you about that. A lot of people take this, this verse out of context. And they try to, to like grab a hold of it and say, this is how God is going to get me what I want. This is how God is going to give me my own personal desires. This is how I'm going to get what I want or what I think I need because I'm claiming it in the name of God. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And, and let me just say this. There are a lot of athletes out there that you see they've got them either tattooed or it's on their, their, their shorts or, what, or their, their socks or jerseys or whatever or their, their shoes. And they're, they're kind of claiming that like that's God's going to give me this victory because I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And unfortunately, that's taking it way out of context because what that might happen. Don't get me wrong. They might claim victory and they might get that in that circumstance, but that's not necessarily what God is concerned with. We go back to what we said a minute ago, God is not concerned with those kinds of things, but he's concerned with our hearts. And Paul is saying, and I think this is why they changed the, the translation and the verbiage in this, because it used to say all things, but now it says all this. He's referring back to verses 10 and 11 and 12. He's saying, I know when you go through tough times, I know that it's hard, I know that it's difficult, but I've learned the secret of being content. I know what it's like to have nothing and I know what it's like to have plenty. I know what it's like to live and want and I know what it's like to have everything that I need, but I can do all this, all that stuff that he's talking about. 
I can do all this through him who strengthens me. And Paul is saying, no matter the circumstance, no matter the situation that you're in, no matter what difficulties you are facing, you can get through it with Jesus. You can endure it with Jesus. In fact, you can come out on the other side of it much, much better with Jesus. Our lives are like this, right? One minute you can be up here and the next minute you can be down there. If we don't learn to stand firm, then we're not going to make it on our own. And you know what? We can't make it on our own. We have to have Jesus to get through this. And this is what Paul is telling the Philippian church. I can do all this, all those circumstances through him. Paul's very clear in that. We have to have Jesus. We have to draw our strength from Jesus. And the same thing goes for your salvation and for mine. I saw a lot of head nodding earlier when I said, we've all messed up. We all fail. I saw a lot of head nodding and I saw other people like get stoned like, he knows. Yeah, I know. We all do it, all right? None of us are going to make it on our own. We're never going to be good enough to do that. We're never going to do enough good things. But the Bible says that in Jesus, we can. You see, the Bible says that for your punishment, for your sin, and for my sin, is separation from God for all of eternity. And nothing we can do is going to get us there. But through Jesus, through his death on the cross, his burial and his resurrection, when we believe in that, when we place our faith in that, the Bible says that whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. And if you're in here today and you've never given your heart and your life to Jesus, before you worry about all this circumstance stuff and getting through stuff like that, you need to settle this first. Because without Jesus, you're going to be separated from God for all of eternity. And God doesn't want that. That's why he gave us Jesus John 3, 16, the very most famous verse in the Bible probably, for God so loved the world, for God so loved you, for God so loved me, that he gave his one and only son, that whoever would believe in him would not perish, be separated from God for all of eternity, but have everlasting life. And he wants that for you and he wants that for me. And when we accept that gift of salvation, we place our faith in Jesus, he gives that to us. We're talking about being content. We're talking about placing our faith in Jesus or or drawing our strength from Jesus. And when we read this passage today, the one question that I have for you and the one question that I have for me that I think about when I read this passage is this, am I content with Jesus? Do I believe that Jesus is enough? Do I believe that he can get me through all things? Because when we place our faith in him and we are content in him, he will get us through them. Let's pray together.